truths to be self-evident. That all men are created. As a member of Congress, I get to have a lot of really interesting people in the office. Experts on what they're talking about. This is the podcast for insights into the issues. China, bioterrorism, Medicare for all. In-depth discussions. Breaking it down into simple terms. We hold. We hold. We hold these truths. We hold these truths. With Dan Crenshaw. The eagle has landed. Welcome back, everybody. Let's talk Iran. When Joe Biden was sworn in, he inherited a lot of pretty good circumstances, especially internationally with America standing on the world stage. President Trump proved that peace through strength was the correct way to handle foreign policy. Iran rattled its saber, attacking U.S. bases in Iraq and then embassy in Baghdad, and we responded, killing Qasem Soleimani, the mastermind of Iran's terror in the region. With that strike, we reestablished deterrence. But now, with the Biden administration operating under a peace through appeasement foreign policy, the world is a much more dangerous place. Iran, among other countries, are taking advantage of perceived weakness and flexing their muscle in the region. Iran recently launched ballistic missiles from Iranian territory into Erbil, the capital of the stable and friendly Iraqi Kurdistan region. This is only the most recent attack on Erbil, but unlike the previous attacks that were launched by Iranian-aligned proxy militias from within Iraq, This was the IRGC launching ballistic missiles from Iran. As they escalated, the Biden administration negotiated a new Iran nuclear deal, which now even some Democrats are criticizing. So today we've got, uh, as you know, an expert on the region. Uh, Very happy to have you, Victoria. Thank you so much for for being on the show today. I'll talk a little bit about you. Um, Our guest today is Dr. Victoria Coates, a distinguished fellow at the American Foreign Policy Council an art historian and a political consultant, previously served on the National Security Council, first as senior director for the Middle East and North Africa, and then as deputy national security advisor before moving to the Department of Energy to serve as a senior advisor to the Trump administration. Uh, You've worked for Senator Ted Cruz as well as a um, national security advisor. And you got your start in national security as a blogger on Red State while teaching art history at the University of Pennsylvania. So it's pretty interesting um, how you got from there to there. Uh, it sounds like, I guess the story is, uh, Donald Rumsfeld's team reached out to you, like noticed your work, something you've written and the rest was history. Pretty much. Well, thanks for having me on Congressman uh, Crenshaw. It's, it's fun to be back on the Hill. Uh, what, what happened was that we were blogging anonymously at that, at that time. And, uh, there are actually a number of, of prominent folks who were in that, in that boat, many of whom have not yet been unmasked, but, uh, <laughs> The Rumsfeld speech writing team was putting my national security posts into his daily reading and wound up, uh, he contacted Eric Erickson, who was the head of it at the time, and said, I would like that military guy. I think he was expecting something a lot more like you, uh, who writes so well about missile defense, to come down and be the first blogger who interviews me. And uh, Eric said, well, that can be arranged, but he's in for a surprise. Uh, and it wound up not happening because it was right around the uh, the 2006 election, and he resigned. But it wound up that I uh, jumped over to his staff and was director of research on no, 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 no. And you advised President Trump. So it it let's talk about Iran. Uh, obviously, that's what I led with. Um, there, how should we understand their role in the Middle East? Um, and how did Trump understand it versus you think how how Biden understands it? Well, it's, it's diametrically opposed, and today happens to be the one-year anniversary of the restarted negotiations in Vienna, uh, which has just been catastrophic because the original Obama position, which is now the Biden position, is that we were mistaken when we prioritized our relationship with Israel historically and then had increasingly close ties with, with the Gulf states and that Iran is actually the key to peace in the Middle East, uh, despite all evidence to the contrary. And that really was the genesis of the JCPOA, the Obama decision not to uh, pursue the the Green Revolution in 2009. And that was what President Trump instinctively reversed and had both the actions to support the alliance with Israel to a historic degree and then the new initiatives with the Gulf states which led, amazingly, to peace in the Middle East. Well, let's back up to a more, much more basic level, which is um, why is there a divide in the Middle East between Iran and its proxies and everybody else? Well, what, is it, what is the root cause of that divide? And how did that lead to the JCPOA in the first place? What is the JCPOA? Um, how, how should your layman understand that? Right, and it's, uh, the acronyms around this are horrible, so 
stop me if I if I use too many of them out of habit. I mean, the, the sort of standard interpretation of the divide within the Islamic world is between the Sunnis and the Shiites, uh, with the Iranians being Shiites and the uh, Emiratis and Saudis, et cetera, being, being Sunnis. But that's really, I think, a, a simplification. It really grows out of the nature of the 1979 Iranian Revolution and the kind of radical theocracy that was put into place at that time, which I would say has much more in common with the radical Sunnis, your ISIS, Al-Qaeda folk, than, than it does, I mean, than, than they would have with their, with their Sunni counterparts. So the sort of Sunni-Shiite thing is, is a little bit misleading. I think it's more an approach that the current government of Iran, the Islamic Republic, embraces at openly terrorism as a tool of statecraft. Mm-hmm. It is it, it defines them as a regime. They have found it an effective means of oppression at home and power projection abroad. And that is why I think the concept of a nuclear deal, which is what this joint collective plan of action, I don't know what that means. Yeah. United Nations gobbledygook. Important to note it was never signed. People talk about our giving our word and signing something that never happened. It was implemented by the Security Council, mm-hmm. so that's not binding. And the you know the notion that the they sh- this regime should not get a nuclear weapon is sound, and President Trump agreed with that. But he thought this was certainly not the mechanism to ensure that that would be the case. And, and let's just go into a little bit more detail about what the mechanism is. I mean, what were the arguments for? The JCPOA, the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action, let's just call it the Iran nuclear deal from now on. Um, and what, again, what were the basic tenets of it um, and what were the criticisms and, and support for it? The argument for it is that it restricted Iran's ability to expand their civil nuclear program and it was based on the premise that we agreed with their assertion that they had never had a nuclear or military dimension to that program, mm-hmm. which was proven to be a lie. So then they said they hadn't had a military dimension since 2002, so that made it somehow okay. Uh, but that the imperative to get a deal on the civil nuclear program outweighed concerns about military proxies, regional terrorism, ballistic missiles, all of these other things. And so that was the imperative behind that deal. It has many weaknesses and flaws. A number of terrorists, including Soleimani, were taken off sanctions lists in that deal. The regime got hundreds of billions of dollars of sanctions relief, some of it as is famously known in cash, Uh, and it did nothing to curb their behavior. And probably the worst thing about it is that there are time limits on it sunsets Mm -hmm. uh, that some have already passed, others are coming up imminently, and apparently they are not updated in whatever new Mm -hmm. deals coming out of Vienna. And and just to be clear, when we say restrictions on civil nuclear use, it means uranium enrichment levels, right? And and the number of centrifuges you can have, Mm -hmm. and, and, and then technically the purposes to which you can apply the program. John Kerry famously came out and told CBS News that they were going to use it to cure cancer. Hmm. Sadly, that has not happened. Yeah, <laughs> wouldn't that be something? Um, you're right, it, because you, if you enrich uranium past a certain point, um, I you know I think our weapons grade uranium would be like ninety percent enriched. So they were limited to under four uh, percent. So that that's the that's the goal. Um, then I think, I think, and like you said, those restrictions were loosened um, at a five-year mark, a 10-year mark, and a 15-year mark. So what are the, so why do, why, why does the other side of the argument think that just, that that's naive, doesn't work? Well, I think for, for starters, the revelation by the Israelis in 2018 of the Iranian nuclear archive demonstrates that the whole thing was predicated on a lie. Mm-hmm. They did have the intention to pursue, to pursue a weapon they kept the plans very carefully and very secretly. And if they if they were being sincere, they had an easy path. They could have just handed over that archive in 2015 and said, here, you know, we had this. We did want to do it, but as a show of good mm-hmm. faith, we were handing it over. They didn't do that. Right. And so at that point, for me, all bets are off. They are not negotiating in good faith. You can't believe any of their assurances. And so going into a deal 
which they treated as, as a deal among equals. And it's never been clearly explained to me why Great Britain, France, and Germany were all at the table and the EU, mm -hmm. uh, which was basically a double tap. But then your other negotiating partners are, are the Chinese and the Russians. So I'm not quite sure how that was ever considered a recipe for success. But as I said, from my, from my perspective, the whole thing was based on a lie. Yeah, so it's based on this sort of um, false premise, but also as, as far as verification goes, I mean, wasn't it also true you, uh, that there was restrictions on where inspectors could actually go? Oh, absolutely. And you know, we, we watched them. It's public satellite imagery in August of, of 2015 start to move things around and clean things up. Mm -hmm. So even when the inspectors did get in, they weren't getting a clear picture of what was actually there. All right. So... If, if you're Iran, and, and, and one of the, my main arguments against it too is, is you, you really remove all your leverage and in 10 to 15 years, you're back at the table and you really have got nothing. Mm -hmm. You know, um, the Iranians will say, okay, you're done. You're done coming in. Um, we, we abided by the deal and maybe they did. Maybe their entire plan was to abide by the deal um, because they're patient people and they, they know that this might be the best pathway to sort of both normalization um, and the, the nuclear weapon that they want. So, so how did how did the Trump administration view this differently, did, and and how did they treat our allies differently? How did they what what was what was the new strategy if, if we're going to toss toss away the JCPOA? Uh, well, the president's position was that we had to enter any negotiations from a position of strength, mm -hmm. uh, which might seem like negotiating one on one, but he's good at negotiating. So his his idea, uh, which was implemented across the administration, was basically to break Iran economically. Mm -hmm and force them to sue for terms. Uh, we looked at the Iran-Iraq war as a model where when things got so painfully bad that the then Supreme Leader said, we're gonna have to drink the poison chalice, mm -hmm. you know, and, and figure out a way to make peace or else they would lose power. And President Trump was never interested in a formal policy of regime change implemented by the United States and Iran. I think he would have been very happy had the people of Iran decided mm -hmm. to, to change their government. So that was not his goal. Uh, his goal was to punish them for their bad behavior until they changed that behavior. And I think had we had a second term, knowing what had been done to that economy, you know, the crisis they were in this time last year, mm -hmm. when they were basically out of foreign reserves. And, you know, the Biden administration decided to take their, you know, stranglehold off mm -hmm. and you know we've had very disturbing reports in recent weeks about the expansion of illicit uh, Iranian oil trade which is now not even really hidden I mean it's just pretty mm -hmm. much out there in the open and and they're renegotiating a deal they think this is this is urgent um, so I you know I suppose the, the the assumption is that if it's so urgent it must mean Iran has every intention of getting a nuclear bomb Right. And so that's what's kind of funny about this. Like we, we can think on the one hand, we can believe that they're that they can be persuaded to be good actors. But on the other hand, we know that the reason we need to persuade them is because they're bad actors pursuing a nuclear bomb. Um, and, and, if, and, and, and to think that just removing some sanctions will persuade them otherwise when they when they when nothing has changed mm -hmm. geopolitically. Right. I mean, because they still have these sworn enemies, Israel and Saudi Arabia. So they. So nothing has changed for them. I don't, I don't know why we think that will necessarily work. There's really a disconnect from reality. And the, the other thing that's emerged since Christmas is that the lead negotiator, because the, remember, the Iranians won't sit down with us. That was the other major distinction with President Trump, who was insisting from the get-go you know, that he needed to meet at least with Rouhani, if not the supreme leader, who he understood to be the true decision-maker. He was like, I'm not going to sit down with Zarif or some other Iranian, you know, lackey. Mm -hmm. You know, I, if, if, if we're going to have a meeting, I'm going to meet with the top leadership and figure out if we can get to some kind of arrangement. And if not, I'm going to walk away. But the idea that this Michael Oleanov, the uh, lead Russian negotiator, is the person who's running back and forth between the two hotels, because they won't even stay in the same hotel, which is probably a good thing, Uh carrying messages. I mean, who knows what he's saying to the Iranians? Mm -hmm. He could be saying, I mean, they could just be sitting around laughing it up at us. And then he comes back with some, some message. And what the, I found even more ironic is here we are tying ourselves in knots over Ukraine because Putin might use a nuclear weapon in Ukraine 
while depending on the Russians to negotiate a nuclear deal with the Iranians. Yeah, yeah. So it, it just none of this makes any sense. And so it, it's what is you, we mentioned earlier the the strategy of the Trump administration was create leverage, um, argue from a position of strength. So it's not like they were opposed to any deal at all. It's just that we need a good deal. Um, so what does a good deal look like? Well, a good deal would be something the Iranians would only agree to out of sheer self-preservation because they really thought they were circling the drain. Mm-hmm. And it would involve the drastic, I mean, not even reduction, the cutting off of all the regional pro- proxies, your alphabet mm-hmm. soup of Hezbollah, Hamas, the Houthi, uh, the uh, Shia militias in Iraq, all those folks, you know, get cut off. Mm-hmm. And we know they, that was in the process of happening because they were running out of money and, and they, they would sadly mourn that the golden times were over. There's a great quote in the New York Times of the Hezbollah guy being so sad that all his money had been cut off. And, mm-hmm. uh, so that, that could work. Then they would need to come clean on the ballistic missile program. Uh, they, that they are not trying to launch a peaceful satellite. Mm-hmm. Uh, they are trying to come up with a means to deliver a nuclear weapon and that that needs to end immediately. Uh, you know, ideally it would, and I don't know if you could get there in this context, it would include some political liberalization uh, for the Iranian people. That might have to be a separate effort. Again, ideally it would, mm-hmm. it would be in there. And then, and then finally a, a true accounting for the nuclear program. Mm-hmm. You know, that they, they would feel they had to give all that up. Well, okay, and, and here's another scenario. I mean, what if what if the compromise is keep it to the nuclear stuff, okay? Because one of our arguments against the around nuclear deal was that even, even with the nuclear, yeah, it ignored all these other things, which is frustrating, but even the thing it was supposed to accomplish, we don't feel it really accomplished that. So let, let's, let's talk about the specifics. How would you make it accomplish just the, the nuclear um, part of it, which means no nuclear weapons? It's it it again. It's it's difficult for me to see it happening unless the regime felt under an existential threat. No, I get so that, the, but is it so like is it like would, anytime, anywhere inspections, yeah, no need, matter what? For some period of time, it would have to be yeah. a complete uh, inspections, access to personnel, access to military sites, and access to academic sites. A lot of this nonsense has gone on in their universities, uh, which they define as as separate, and therefore. Right. You don't have access to it. So there, there would just have to be a whole range. Uh, you know, and you could potentially, depending on, nobody actually knows how far they are mm-hmm. uh, or what their intentions are, but you could go back and look at the Libyan example as a model and how that was carried out and the verification uh, mechanisms in that. So I, I think that would be possible, not ideal in my mm-hmm. views, but possible. Uh, and do you think this group of uh, negotiators under the Biden administration is is going to push for those extra limitations, or is it just going to be the same rehashing of the old deal? Is it the I, same people who's who's negotiating? Uh, for us? This is Rob Malley, uh, so it's a slightly different lead negotiator. I mean, John Kerry really took the lead uh, as Secretary of State. Uh, Tony Blinken appears to be wisely keeping a little distance hmm. from it, and. Uh, my understanding is that the Iranians simply have not budged and that it is basically they're just reprinting the JCPOA with a new date. Yep. Now, the, the interesting thing from my perspective, because it was one of my bureaucratic triumphs in the Trump administration, was actually getting the IRGC, the uh, Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps, designated as a terrorist group, mm-hmm. that that appears to be the final sticking point for the mm-hmm. Iranians. Um which is interesting because you have Blinken and Molly and all these people running around saying it's just symbolic. Well, then why do they want it so badly? Mm-hmm. It isn't just symbolic. Uh, it has severe travel restrictions. It has material support for terrorism. And it, it makes it easier for their victims to sue them. I see. Uh, so for all these reasons, it was a just and desirable thing to do. It drives them nuts. And... You know, the case was, was made. I mean, it took us a year to do it mm-hmm. under the strident objections of both the state and the de- Department of Defense. It was unprecedented action, but we got it done because the evidence was so overwhelming mm-hmm. that the IRGC is the operational terrorist arm of the government. Right. Um, talk to us about 
uh, Biden standing in the Middle East, uh, this administration standing in the Middle East with with other countries. I mean, it, news broke last few weeks ago that both the Saudis and Emiratis refused to take calls from President Biden. Uh, most recently, it was reported the Saudis are considering selling uh, oil to China in, in yuan, which is the Chinese currency, rather than the dollar. Um, that's that's significant. Um, how do we go from brokering the Abraham Accords and sort of bringing this peace to the Middle East? And, of course, that the whole peace to the Middle East notion comes from the, the Arab-Israeli conflict, just to be clear. You know, there's never going to be peace in the Middle East. We're talking about that peace. Um, but the Abraham Accords were a historic um, step in the right direction there. Um, what, what's, what's the environment like now? It's, it's painful. Uh, I've been back three times over the, the first year of the Biden administration in Qatar, UAE, Bahrain, Saudi, and Israel. And you know, in, in many ways, it's heartbreaking because those relationships were so strong. Uh, under the previous administration, and particularly, you know, it's a big day for, for energy policy today. When I was at DOE, I got to spend, it was COVID year because it was the last year, but I was in Abu Dhabi for six weeks and Riyadh for seven weeks as uh, the Secretary of Energy's representative to try to forge a new art energy architecture with them. And it spanned a whole host of, of interesting topics from AI and cybersecurity to civil nuclear and UAE, uh, the interest of the Saudis in, in getting to a civil nuclear program. But then given, uh, and I know this is near and dear to your heart as a Texan, you know, the extraordinary American energy renaissance, you know, how, how could we, outside of the cartel structure, partner with them on energy st stability globally? Mm -hmm. And they were open to those discussions. And last year, I mean, a UAE almost pulled out of OPEC. I mean, we should have been pushing for that. But instead, I mean, you know, and, and, and you know, nobody's perfect, but these are relationships that go back decades and are enormously powerful. Uh, and so yeah, I always found it hopelessly naive of Biden, who's supposed to have all of this foreign policy experience, to you know, run around talking about the Saudis as a pariah, won't talk to MBS, and then suddenly is begging them to pump more oil mm -hmm. this fall during you know the, as the energy crisis started to pick up, and of course they're not going to take his phone calls. I mean, it it, it it the whole thing was again unhinged from from reality. And you know, as as Pennsylvanian, you know, it's 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 painful for for us to watch. You know, their policies depress our domestic ability to produce you know, causing pain at the pump, and then mm -hmm. you know, they don't have that, because I guess the closest analogy from the Trump administration perspective would be when we took the oil waivers on Iran to zero. Mm -hmm. And there was a great deal of distress that this was somehow going to cause, you know, massive spikes in, in oil prices. And we worked to direct, I mean, Aramco sent over a delegation. We sat in the EEOB and went through barrel through barrel. You know, what does China legitimately need? What does India need? What does South Korea need? And agreed that between our two countries, you know, with some help from Kuwait and UAE, we could produce, and we did. And there was barely a blip. Yeah. Uh, and so that can be done, but you got to work with them, and then you've got to have the domestic have to back it up. And what about Israel? Have, have things changed with Israel as far as relationships? It's again, it's brutal. Uh, you know the the. Biden administration has gone back to prioritizing the Palestinian issue, which is what reversing that failed historic construct that you had to get a deal with the Palestinians before Israel could not normalize with their neighbors. That's what we proved was untrue because the Palestinians were so impossible to deal with. And, you know, they had their moment of ultimate leverage, which is probably 2017, 18 timeframe. Anyone who would talk to us, we would say, the president expects you to drive a good deal. He doesn't expect you to just roll mm -hmm. over. But right now, you have something everyone wants. I can't tell you you're still going to have that. And now mm -hmm. they don't. Now it's happened. You know, what, they, what was the thing? The peace between Israel and UAE okay. and, and, and Bahrain. You know, they, they were holding the veto on that. And what changed is those Gulf countries would no longer give them that veto, at which point their most powerful card disappeared. So for the 
Obama, or the Biden folks, rather, to try to stuff that genie back in the bottle and reduce Israel to sort of second-class status that it's somehow parallel to the status of the Palestinians mm-hmm. makes no sense. They're, they're just not, they're, they're not equal parties. They're not equal allies of the United States. And, you know, the incredible investment that the U.S. taxpayer has made in Israel you know, is just that. It's an investment in a partnership that has huge value for us. And to be basically throwing that away because we're worried about a deal with the Palestinians is just nonsensical. Got it. Awesome. So we've got a lot of work to do, (laughs) as it sounds like. Victoria, thanks so much for being on and uh, giving us your expertise. Well, thank you. And thanks for your leadership on these issues. And we're really going to be looking to the Congress over the next two years to keep us safe. (laughs) Appreciate that. (laughs) Yeah, don't hold your breath. All right. Victoria Coates. Thanks, everybody.